our theme from last time where we were looking at sealer ethics. Um, and we um, last time we talked about how uh, one way of looking at the Buddha's approach to ethics is to see it as a kind of virtue ethics where his concern is with training ourselves to become a particular kind of person, a person who's characterized by particular virtues like generosity, love, compassion, etc. Um, and the idea here is that ethics is not about following rules. It's about becoming a certain kind of person and becoming a certain kind of person through a system of training or education. So if you look at the, the Eightfold Path, you could see this is a system of training or it's an educational curriculum. And the object of the exercise is to become a certain kind of person. So most obviously, for example, to become an enlightened person. Uh, but uh, we talked about how the central thing here is that it's not a rules-based ethics. Um, and so that the, the, the precepts are the, um, the, when we take on the five precepts, um, the pancha sila, the fivefold sila, fivefold ethics, these are the, uh, each one of them is a sikapada. Uh, and this is a word that gets translated as precept or training precept, but it's actually, uh, is more accurately, accurately translated as way of training. And the difference is that a precept is a rule, but a way of training is not a rule. It's something else. It's something that we undertake to do or not do. It's something that if we undertake to do it, we might undertake to do it occasionally or full time, a little bit, a lot, depending on circumstances. So this is the Buddha's um, approach to ethics seen as a virtue ethics. Um, and we looked in particular at the link between sila and samadhi, between um, ethics and meditation. And we said how the key point here is that for the Buddha, the purpose of ethical behavior is to create harmony within one's own heart and mind and within one's community. And if I, have harmony, internal, psychological, external, social, then meditation, samadhi becomes much easier. So there's a very close link for the Buddha between ethics and meditation. Um, and here we come to the second aspect of the Buddha's approach to ethics, and that is um, ethics as a form of consequentialism. In other words, that the Buddha is concerned with the consequences of our actions. Um, so this is the uh, another side of his understanding of, of ethics. Uh, now, essentially, um, we, well, we've said that he's 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 got a system of training. The training is known as a path, the eightfold path, and the point about a path is that it leads to somewhere. So he's got a destination in mind. And the job is, what we have to do is to get from here, wherever we are, to the end of that path, to its destination, which in classical terms is awakening. And if we're going to take on that project, that means we need to work out the difference between those actions which take us in that direction, along that path, versus those actions that take us in another direction. Um, and, the, and the Buddha expressed this in terms of learning to distinguish between the, the wholesome and the unwholesome, the skillful and the unskillful, or the way he put it, the kusala and the akusala. Um, now this approach includes a sense of causality. So what can I do that will cause me to move toward awakening? What must I avoid because it will cause me to move away from awakening. So there's a sense of causation, that, which is also built into um, the Buddha's approach to ethics. And of course, this takes us to karma, 
and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Karma Vipaka, action and its ripening. Um, so we um, we have this um, or one one approach to ethics is uh, the, is the consequentialist. In other words, we have this sense that uh, uh, an action is good if it has a good result. Um, so for example, is it ethical to lie? Now, most people would say, no, it's not ethical to lie. The Buddha certainly said, it's not ethical to lie. But let's say you're hiding a refugee. Let's say the border force knocks on your door and they ask if you know where this person is. Would it be ethical to say the truth? Uh, yes, he's actually he's under the bed in the spare bedroom. Just go down that hall and turn right. Would that be the ethical thing to do? And it's the truth. Or would it be ethical to say, oh yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, I saw him last week. He was getting on a bus to Adelaide. Would that be the ethical thing? So um, it turns out to be more complicated than we might have begun with. That there, there, there are certain actions which are not inherently ethical or unethical. We can judge them on the basis of their result. Um, and this is, this is included in the way that the Buddha himself frames what he sees as the fundamental ethical question. Remember last time we were talking about each of us as human beings are faced with a fundamental ethical question or problem. And the question is, how should I live? Uh, each of us is faced with this question. Each of us has come up with an answer. And the answer is how we are in fact living. So that's our ethics. The Buddha's version of this question is, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is praiseworthy? What is blamable? What ought I to do? What ought I not to do? What, having done it, will bring me harm and suffering over the long term? And what will bring me welfare and happiness over the long term? Uh, now to unpack this passage completely would take a lot longer than half an hour. So we're just going to focus on his noticing how the Buddha's interest is in the long-term results of our actions. What will bring me welfare and happiness over the long term? What will bring me harm and suffering over the long term? Uh, now, first of all, when he says me, so he's, he's talking about the individual, um, I think it's important to get a sense of the social context. Uh, we, in our culture, we are heavily individualist. So we have the rights of the individual. Uh, we really emphasize that we have. We have the ideal of individual activity, entrepreneurial, economic activity, and so on. And our sense of the individual is someone um, separated from everybody else. So it's, it's a very atomistic view of human nature and of society. It comes out especially in economics and anything influenced by economics. Um, in that sense, somebody commented that the Buddha is not interested in the individual, he's interested in the person. Because a person is always connected. A person is always in a relationship. There's no such thing as a person who is not in a network of relationships. So when the, when the Buddha is saying, what will bring me happiness and welfare, what will bring me harm and suffering, is assuming that the me is the, at the center of a network of relationships. And whatever happens at that center is going to radiate out and influence others. And equally, what's, whatever is happening to others is going to radiate in and influence me. So it's the socially embedded individual or the socially embedded person that the Buddha is talking about. He doesn't explicitly say it, he just assumes it. Like to him it's just so obvious that he doesn't actually need to, to explain it. Uh, so it's, we could say it's the person rather than the individual. So this brings us to karma. Um, what are we going for time? Uh, karma uh, is a 
Sanskrit word that simply means action. In Pali, which is the language of the Buddha, it's kamma. And in English, it is karma, because karma is in the English dictionary, therefore it's an English word. Very badly defined, of course, but it's there. So I'm going to use um, karma, uh, but it means simply action. And the Buddha classified himself as a teacher of action. Um, and in the, and the karma was a concept that he inherited from the Vedic tradition. Now, originally in the, in, with the, in the Vedas, karma is the action of the sacrifice or actions that are performed in during rituals and in particular during the sacrifice. And the sacrifice was crucial to Vedic religion. It was the centerpiece of the whole activity. And in order to perform a successful sacrifice, you had to perform the, the ritual actions correctly in the right order. Otherwise you screwed up the sacrifice. So karma action is very important because it's without it, unless if it's not correct, you mess the, the sacrifice up and you don't get the result. Um, the Jains later took this concept and they um, gave it a spin and they included a moral consequence to the action. Um, so the, um, uh, the idea that our actions have a moral consequence, and this was developed by the Jains, but they kept the idea that actions are physical. The Buddha inherits this tradition and he turns it around and he says, actually what's central is the state of the mind with which one does the action. Um, so the state of the mind that stimulates the action and the state of the mind uh, that results from the action. And this is where he focused on. Uh, and again, we've got to be careful with, with language. When the Buddha talks about mind, he means more than just what's going on up here in the head. He means the heart as well. So um, the, the term often used is citta, which could be translated as heart mind. In some contexts, heart. Um, but it includes the emotional, the affective, as well as the cognitive, the thinking side, both. Um, and so the Buddha focused on the inner effect of action and he saw action itself as fundamentally inner. Uh, and in one very famous passage, he says, I declare that choice is action. We perform actions of body, speech or mind after choosing. So choice here is my translation of the Pali word chaitana, often translated intention. That's probably a more common translation. So, but in any event, it's the impulse or the movement within the heart, within the mind, that stimulates the action. And the Buddha says, that's what I mean when I'm talking about karma. And what he's getting at is that it's the choices that we make that create our lives. If I want to develop a life in which I live well and happily, and the people around me live well and happily, that means I have to pay attention to the choices that I make because these choices have consequences. Uh, and I've got to learn uh, about this. I've got to work out what are the right choices to make that will lead me in the right direction. What are the choices that I make that lead me in the wrong direction? These are the ones I need to drop and the other ones I need to cultivate. Um, and so this intersects with virtue ethics. So for example, the Buddha says that generosity is a fundamental human virtue. Um, it's so fundamental for him that it's not, there's nothing in it. It's not a Buddhist virtue. Um, it's for, for the Buddha, it's a human virtue that's universal. Um, but, and, and he says, look, it's really important that we become generous people. So again, this is virtue ethics. How do I become a certain kind of person? Uh, well, with the way we do that is by practicing generosity. So if I practice generosity, I become a generous person. If I practice stinginess, I become a stingy person. Uh, so how do I practice generosity through dana? 
So dana means um, gift or giving. It's an action noun. It's, it's, so it's both the act of giving and it's what is given. Um, so dana is the practice that cultivates generosity. So if I find myself making choices to be stingy, uh, I won't, I could give, but I'm not going to, because I think I'll save the money. Then that has an effect on the heart. And the effect on the heart is to make me a less generous person. Equally, of course, I might decide, look, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a lot in this instance because I wanna become a generous person, but then later on regret it because I gave too much actually for my circumstances. Again, that will make me a less generous person because my generosity is clashing with my wisdom. Uh, so again, it's not straightforward necessarily, but you get this, the basic point that um, that's the impulses from within the heart that lead to action and these actions lead to forming a human life. So this is where the Buddha focuses on. Um, can we have questions or is that, that's not gonna work, is it? Uh, Patrick, we can have questions. If you, if you finish a Dharma talk, we can have questions if you want. Okay. Uh, is it making you sense so far? Okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll just, Yes, it's making chug ahead for a bit more. Yeah, yes. I was, it, it is making sense. Yes, because we can't record. I shall the have faith, Patrick. Uh, we can't record ah, the questions. Okay. So, so if you finish a Dharma talk, okay. then the questions can be un, uh, you know, not recorded. Okay, so I shall, I shall, I shall, I shall continue. Um, karma is a is a very complex uh, and controversial subject. So I just want to focus on, um, well, first of all, one of the major misunderstandings about karma is that it's treated sometimes as a form of fatalism. And this is very common in Asia, in Buddhist Asia. And it's used, this understanding or misunderstanding is used to justify social injustice. Okay, if you've got people who are poor and desperate, well, it's because they did bad things in their previous life and they should just get their act together and they'll be re reborn in a better life. Um, now this is this view of karma as fatalism was explicitly rejected by the Buddha. Uh, in one discourse, outsider teachings, he lists three views held by teachers in other traditions <laughs> that are about what is it that creates the conditions of our lives. And he lists these three views and he rejects all of them. And these are, the first one is whatever we experience is caused by what we did in the past. So he rejects that. Whatever we experience is caused by the will of God. So he rejects that. And whatever we experience has no cause but arises spontaneously. Um, and this is, dead set fatalism. Um, now the reason why he rejected these views, uh, he didn't say I reject these because they're not true. He said, I reject these because if you actually believe this, any of these, then you will give up because there's nothing you can do. Like if everything that happens to me is a result of things that happened in the past, well, I can't change the past, can I? <laughs> So I'm stuck just replaying the old records. Um, if everything, whatever I experience is caused by the will of God, well, I can't change his mind or her mind or their mind. Um, and if there's no cause, but things just arise spontaneously, well, everything's out of, out of my control. So the only rational response, if I really believe this, is to give up. Um, so the Buddha was very strong on no, you never give up. There is always something we can do. No matter how bad a situation, there is always something we can do. And our, it's our job as practitioners to find that something and to do it. Uh, and in a sense, we're, we're never released from that, that obligation. Um, 
one of the um, one of the uh, uh, one of the implications of this is that for the Buddha, the teaching of karma is not focused on the past, which is often the way we we talk about it. It's always focused on the present. Um, the example I like to give is, let's say you're stepping across a busy street in the city. Let's say some crazy drunk driver who's speeding um, hurls, hurls his car around the corner, smashes into you and drives off. Let's say you're lying in the gutter, broken and bleeding. Let's say a compassionate Buddhist uh, witnesses this and comes up to you and says, well, that's your bad karma. Now, I mean, obviously this person is a complete bastard, but apart from that, would he be right from the Buddha's perspective? And the answer is, of course, no. It's the driver's bad karma. The driver made some really bad choices that has resulted in all this suffering. That's his bad karma. Your karma, as you're lying in the gutter, is, okay, this happened, now what? What do I do about it? How do I respond to this? That's your karma. But you notice it's about the present and the response to the present and how do I shape my future given this present? What choices do I make given this situation right now? Uh, and of course, in the, in the traditional context, karma is seen in terms of life after life after life which means there's a very big future that we're, we're faced with. Um, and um, along with that very big future are infinite possibilities that can arise. Um, in other words, for the Buddha, karma is a teaching of opportunity. The future is open. Let's make a good one. That's his, that's his focus on it. Uh, another way of misunderstanding the doctrine of karma is to see it as a system of rewards and punishments. And a lot of people make this mistake, including academics, you should know better. Now, karma vipaka, action and its ripening, is not a system of rewards and punishments. It's a law of nature for the Buddha, uh, like the law of gravity. So, for example, if I fall down a staircase and injure myself, so I'm lying at the bottom of the staircase and I'm looking up. Uh, I don't think that the staircase has punished me. I, that is not what happened. Uh, it's just nature that if I trip at the top of the staircase and fall down, then I'm likely to be injured. It's just nature. It's got nothing to do with rewards and punishments. Uh, the other a uh, reason why it's definitely not a system of rewards and punishments if, is if in order to have such a system, you have to have a rewarder, someone up there who's handing out the rewards or alternatively handing out the punishments. And for the Buddha, there isn't anyone. So it's just the law of nature. Um, now this leads us to some interesting and rather upsetting conclusions once we see it like this, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we tend not to see it like this. There's one discourse um, called A Lump of Salt, where the Buddha um, explains the system of karma in terms of uh, the law of nature rather than cosmic justice. He says, if you have a lump of salt and you drop it into a mug of water, He's asking his students, what happens to the water? And they say, oh, it's, it's salty and becomes even undrinkable. He says, if you take the same lump of salt and drop it into the Ganges River, what happens? And they say, well, nothing happens. It's too small. It, can't, it doesn't affect the, the Ganges. Um, and the Buddha goes on to say that uh, if if you have someone, a person whose ethics is poor, whose heart 
chitta, heart-mind, is narrow and limited, and whose wisdom is undeveloped, they may perform a, an unwholesome action which has really serious consequences for them. Whereas someone whose ethics is good, whose heart is wide, and whose wisdom is developed, performs exactly the same um, unwholesome action, and the result it could be so minor that it's barely noticeable. So the same action can have radically different, coming from the same impulse, the same motivation, can have radically different effects on different people, depending on how developed they are. Um, so the results of action, in other words, do not come about automatically. They do not come about because of some cosmic code. Even in the Buddhist tradition, often um, karma is presented in this way, in, for, in terms of morality tales. So you mustn't steal in this life because if you do, you'll be reborn poor in the next life. Or you mustn't be violent in this life because if you do, you will be suffer violence in your next life. Um, but it's actually not like that. It's much more complex. Um, the example that the Buddha gives in this discourse is he gives the example of the results of theft. So he says that um, you, you can have a person who steals something and he's caught, goes before the courts and is imprisoned for what they've done. You can have another person who steals exactly the same amount and the police are not interested. He does not go to court. He does not go to prison. What's the difference between the two people? Uh, and the Buddha explains, the person who is imprisoned is one who is poor, or the person who escapes imprisonment is one who is rich. It's a very interesting example. And of course, he's being brutally honest. He says, look at society. There is one law for the rich and one for the poor in his day. And of course, I think if we look at our own society, we realize actually things haven't changed, not really. Um, so he gives this, this um, example of social injustice to illustrate that it's not um, a system of um, uh, codified rewards and punishments. It's much more alive than that. So um, it's got nothing to do with justice. It's simply the natural workings out of cause and effect. That's all. And one of the lessons that comes out of this, of course, is that clearly we want justice in our society. But there's no way we can shove that job onto some mystical, metaphysical, cosmic system of karma and say it's up to karma will take care of it. If a justice is a human product, if we want justice, we have to create it. Uh, it's not going to drop from the sky. Uh, and so this is, I think, part of the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the Buddha's um, emphasis on um, action and its ripening as natural process. How are we going for time? Oh, almost finished. Um, finally, speaking of time, uh, notice how the Buddha, when the Buddha speaks about the results of action, the term he uses is vipaka, which literally means ripening. So that's an agricultural expression. Um, so our, the effects of our actions gradually ripen like fruit. So let's say I want a nice orange. I have an orange seed, I hurl it on the ground, and I stare at it fiercely, expecting it to hand me an orange. Uh, well, no, that's not gonna happen. Um, if I want an orange, I have to have the right soil, a good seed, the right climate, the right amount of care, and I've got to give it the time to ripen. So it's a gradual process with multiple factors involved, and eventually over time, the result comes. 
And again, when we're talking about meditation practice, uh, one of the terms that the Buddha uses to talk about it is bhavana. And bhavana means cultivation. Again, it's an agricultural term. We are cultivating the chitta. We are cultivating our heart mind when we are doing meditation and practicing dharma. And again, it's purely nature. There's no divine intervention involved. And we need the right conditions and we cultivate those conditions patiently over a period of time and we get the result. Okay, I think we've run out of time. So, uh, 